We have a full coverage of the day's stories, but a quick look at the highlights. Tonight, gunshots, <laughs> protests, declaration. Mali Ahuma to Governor Stephen Sang to spend the night in police custody. And another oil leak in Kiboko. KPC now admits it failed to install leak detection system in multi-billion projects. Plus, Division of Revenue Deadlock continues. County government's operations could grind to a halt. We have the final meeting on Thursday and we shall be able to update you and the country on where we are. Mediation Committee's last-ditch efforts to salvage the dire situation. Also tonight, more investors record statements against a real estate firm. Where is that money? Four banks fund embattled developer with 1.6 billion shillings. NTV Tonight with Dennis Okari and Olive Burrows. Good evening. Our sign language interpreter tonight is Flora Atieno. Nandi Governor Stephen Sang is today a guest of the state following his arrest over the destruction of a tea farm in his county. Well, the governor's arrest came just before the Eldred High Court granted an injunction barring his arrest for 10 days. He's being held at the Kisumu Central Police Station. Three days after he was captured mowing down tea bushes in Nandi County, the governor, Stephen Sang, has been taken into custody. But it wasn't an easy arrest. The governor had presented himself to the detectives at Capsabet, hoping to be released after recording a statement. His carefully laid down plan went wrong as soon as he finished giving that statement. The police came to arrest him, but his supporters, who had accompanied him to the station, attempting to block the police from taking him. The police had to use tear gas to disperse the rowdy crowds and whisked the governor into a speeding vehicle. I'm requesting you, Mufanya Vila to Nataka. We want to Nataka, I have a record statement, Mali, incident in Nataka. That is the only thing we want. From Kapsabet, the governor was driven to Kisumu Central Police Station. Here, he was booked into the station for further questioning. He's here because of uh, the crime that he committed just the other day. While he was being processed in Kisumu, his lawyers moved to court in Eldoret to get an injunction barring his arrest at least for 10 days. He has given us enough information that will require us to release him on bond because that is legal, it's a requirement, we cannot refuse him a bond. Before his dramatic arrest, the governor had resurfaced three days after he was caught on camera leading the cutting down of tea bushes at Kibwari Tea Farm in Nandi County. He defended his actions. Brenda Wanga, NTV. Investors claiming they were conned into buying property with the Soraya Property Group are today turned up at the DCI headquarters to record their statements. Some claim the group owes them for properties they invested in as far back as 2014. However, in a rejoinder, the property group, in a statement sent out to newsrooms, said it has secured funds from four local banks to complete some of the stalled projects. Gladys Kishanja with more. The Directorate of Criminal Investigations played host to many who claim to have lost millions in dubious investments with the Soraya Property Group. At first, it was just about 20 investors who had recorded their complaints with the DCI, but the number of disgruntled investors has continued to swell. The number of investors, honestly, should be over 600. What has happened is people didn't know each other. So we've really done a social media push to try and get new investors. In the last about two days, we've gotten an additional about 150 investors, and we're hoping that they will come in and speak. Ruth Wonjiko is one of the many investors that put in their money at the Soraya Property Group promised to live in her own home. But links for always, one of the properties that is linked to the Soraya Property Groups is one of those that never saw the light of day. She put her money in the project back in 2016 and was promised her two apartments would be ready for occupation in a year's time. They told me they will refund my money on condition they get a buyer of the apartment I had applied for. Then I told them who can buy just something, just a, a, a plain rod. 
which you had you have been promising people you to construct since 2016 mm -hmm. up to now Last week, Soraya Property Group put out a paid advertisement on local dailies detailing the status of their projects, outlining how the political instability of 2017 caused construction delays on their end. In a statement sent out this evening, Soraya announced it had secured funding worth 1.6 billion shillings from four local banks to accelerate the completion of stalled housing projects. This comes even as a second property enlisted in their name links at Royal Ongong Road was enlisted to be auctioned in today's dailies. There's a criminal angle in all of this. Surai has taken billions from people. They have charged those properties where they promised us units to the banks for billions more. Where is that money? But even as investors are grappling with whether or not they will get a return on their investment, another storm over the ownership of the four-way junction project is brewing. Moriah does not own that property. It was a project that they started. He approached my father in 2007, says he wants to open a joint venture that can make affordable homes for people in Kenya. And my dad at first did not agree to it. Moriah came three times to the farm. And on the third time, my dad agreed. And the agreement was he comes to the finances, my parents only are going to use one or five acres out of two or six. The Gatabaki family claims the Surayas breached an agreement. It's so sad because the houses they've given my father are just a shell. Inside there's nothing, there's no ground, there's no windows, there's nothing. And he's an owner of the farm. They even kicked him out of a partnership without his knowledge after they were done with him. April 2015, you cannot even tell my father you've kicked him out? Gladys Gashanja and TV. The mediation committee is set up by both houses of parliament to unlock a stalemate over the division of revenue between the national government and county governments has until Thursday this week to reach an agreement on the way forward or risk grounding county operations. Sources within the committee intimate that representatives from both sides are still holding on to their tough positions and that could jeopardize ongoing negotiations and leave counties with no money for development. NTV's political affairs reporter Kennedy Muradi with details. For about a month now, this committee bringing together members of both houses of parliament has been meeting regularly in an effort to unlock a stalemate that now threatens to deny counties their cash in the 2019-2020 financial year. The membership, drawn from senior members of the Senate and the National Assembly, has been locked in a battle over how much money should be disbursed to counties after debate on the division of revenue bill in both houses failed to reach a consensus. In the 2019-2020 financial year, Senate insists the figure disbursed to counties should be 335 billion shillings, an increase of about 21 billion shillings to cater for inflation. The National Assembly, however, argues there is no money available and the counties should make do with the 310 billion shillings, which is a reduction of about 4 billion shillings in the current financial year. Efforts in the ongoing mediation have seen both sides yield a bit of ground as the Senate has settled on 327 billion shillings, with the National Assembly settling for 316 billion shillings, each side insisting it will not cede any more ground. Senate argues the 327 billion shillings cap factors in basic inflation and the yearly salaries increment. We are making good progress. We have the final meeting on Thursday and we shall be able to update you and the country on where we are after our Thursday meeting. If the mediation committee does not reach a consensus by Thursday this week, it will basically mean that counties will not be able to access much of its money as it will only be left with that duty of paying salaries as that division of revenue bill is reintroduced in parliament and goes through this process once again. Sources within the committee indicate there is a likelihood of the mediation committee not reaching an agreement thus defeating the bill. If defeated, however, it can be reintroduced in the House once again immediately with the Speaker using his prerogative understanding order number one. This would in essence mean starting the process afresh and delaying county operations even further. If the bill is completely defeated and the process restarts, the national government Parliament and the judiciary will be able to access their portions, but counties will only be able to pay salaries. Another issue on the table of the mediation team 
was that of the least medical equipment, where despite representatives from the Senate pushing for counties to stop remitting money to pay for it, they did not present a report to that effect. This means counties will continue to honor their contractual obligations on the least medical equipment. Kennedy Muredi, NTV. Now to some security matters. A driver of a public service vehicle was injured after suspected Al-Shabaab militants attacked his vehicle in Bamboo area, Mandera North. The vehicle was traveling from Ramu to Mandera town and witnesses reported hearing gunshots, then an explosion. The driver, Abbas Jat, who is kept with minor injuries, said the militants shot at his vehicle's wheels. Public transport has since been suspended along the dangerous stretch of road from Mandera over insecurity concerns. Just two weeks ago, a similar incident happened in Bamboo area in Mandera North, where another improvised explosive device had been planted on the road. Mandera Police Commander Jeremiah Kusiom has, however, assured passengers of their safety. Well, let's go now to news from the courts. The second prosecution witness in the graft case facing former Nairobi Governor Evans Kidero will give his testimony in chief after the trial court declined to allow an application by the defense team to have him excused from testifying. Kidero's lawyer, James Sorengo, had applied to the court to have Edward Gishanga dropped from the list of witnesses on grounds that the questions he was to answer were not contained in his statements. Orengo claimed that would that would make it difficult for the defense to cross-examine him as evidence he would give is not part of the statement supplied to the defense team by the prosecution. At the High Court's Constitutional Division, the applicants challenging the implementation of the housing fund levy now want their petitions referred to Chief Justice David Maraga to appoint a three-judge bench to determine their case. The petitioners argue the applications raised weighty issues of law which cannot be determined by a single judge. The judge, however, directed the parties to file their responses before taking a date for further directions. And finally, the High Court in Machakos was forced to defer a ruling on the bond application made by suspects charged with the murder of city lawyer Robert Chesang until Friday the 14th. Justice George Odunga had to hear an application filed by the late Chesang's family under a certificate of urgency, seeking to have the case moved from Machakos lawyer Vincent Kiptun, who represents Chesang's family, arguing that denying them bond to any of the accused persons, especially Magistrate Chesang, who is charged with the murder of her husband, had a great beating on the principle of the right to a fair trial. We'll be back before you know it. We take a break.
Welcome back. The Kenya Pipeline Company has now admitted fault for the oil spill in Kiboko, Makweni County, saying it failed to put in place a leak detection system before commissioning the 51 billion shilling project. Was it just an oversight or a failure to learn from past mistakes? Either way, the taxpayer will still have to meet the extra cost of putting in place a leak detection system. KPC says it has taken measures to ensure the leak does not spill into the Kiboko River, but it contradicts a warning by the county's Water Resources Authority, cautioning residents against using the already sullied waters. NTV's Zainab Ismail reports. Kiboko River in Makweni County rests peacefully on the land. But residents now accuse the Kenya Pipeline Corporation of disturbing its peace. They say the oil leak from the Nairobi to Mombasa pipeline had sullied the river. KPC, however, says the spill was far away from the critical spring, a main source of nourishment for residents there. Technicians from the corporation have since repaired the pipeline and dug multiple trenches around the affected area, which also shows that part of the underground water in the area has been contaminated with oil. Outwardly, we now create various pits to try and intercept anything that has gone into the ground. This is just one of the troughs that the Kenya Pipeline Corporation has dug in order to stop the extent to which the oil spill will be reaching the river surrounding this particular area in Kiboko. But residents are of a different opinion. The 20-inch pipeline was designed without any leak detection system, making it as bad as the leak-prone old one that was meant to be replaced in the new venture that was hailed as the grand plan for the nation and one that ingrained modern pipeline monitoring technology that would avoid such incidents as the spilling in the Thanga River in Kibwezi. But it's still a familiar story of profuse apologies and more promises. The frequent leakages have caused massive losses of product, and now the taxpayer will have to pay billions more as the KPC plans to float another tender for the installation of a leak detector along the pipeline. A leak detection system is a, an early warning sign. Uh, I believe if it was there, we, we should have had an early warning. But uh, uh, like I've indicated, uh, this was affected by our own procurement uh, processes, which are prone to competition by everybody. And sometimes being a, uh, a government entity, we end up in a, a situation where we can't move forward when once there is a challenge of such a procurement in court. The Water Resources Authority had already cautioned people who depend on River Kiboko against drinking water from the river as it was contaminated with petroleum products. The letter signed by the head of the WRA in the region, Stephen Munyao, reads in part, and I quote, Following the recent petroleum oil spill from the Kenya Pipeline Company, about 400 to 500 meters from Kiboko Spring, a precautionary notice is hereby issued to water users to seek alternative safe water sources pending confirmatory report on the safety of the water. The pipeline, which costs taxpayers 51 billion shillings to install, transports about 100 million litres per hour. It however remains unclear whether the lack of a leak detection was just an oversight or whether the state entity failed to learn from the Thanga spill in 2015. Zainabi Smile, NTV. In what is part of a worrying trend, a woman in Machakos County is nursing knife wounds inflicted on her by her ex-husband. Rose Mai, who is currently receiving treatment at the Kangundo Level 4 Hospital, says she's been assaulted a number of times by her ex-lover, who's now gone into hiding. 20-year-old Rose Mai squirms in pain as she's wheeled into the Kangundo Level 4 Hospital. Her indelible scars, she says, had been inflicted on her by her ex-husband, a man he identifies as Kelvin Kalela Munguti. Leo 
Apart from the wounds clearly visible on her face, she also bears deep stab wounds on her body. Rose claims she was at home when she was brutalized by her ex-husband. He then locked the door from outside. Her current husband found her, battered and in pain. Rose and Kalela had been married for a year and have a child together, but she says Kalela's insecurities destroyed their marriage. Kalela is on the run. He and Rose are said to have met when they worked together as waiters at a hotel in Tala. The case has been reported at the Tala police station. Sharon Baranga, NTV. A battle over grazing land is unfolding in Taita Tavita County. Camel owners in Taita Tavita County are counting more losses after they found 60 more camels killed. Ibrahim Hussein, a camel owner, says they had reached an agreement with the community to pay them between 800,000 shillings to 1.2 million shillings per year to allow them to graze their 200 camels. They claim that local leaders had incited or rather have incited the community to kill their camels. The herders say they have incurred losses amounting to over 50 million shillings in the last two days since the conflict started. Sasa Gamia amesanywa bahali moja yote imekatwa wote mwangozi iko ndani. Sasa wamekata na tumebata hasara moja kubwa sana. Na hiyo Gamia yote miza mtoto yake hakuna ile amefika mezi mbili. Mtoto yake sasa yote nakaa kulia kwa boma. Hakuli majani. We we'll take a short break. We'll be right back with more stories. Stay with us.
County now says all parking tickets bought through the Jumbo Pay's AGGP platform will remain valid even though it has cut ties with Web Tribe Limited and announced a new revenue collection platform. Anita Nkonge reports on the confusion that marked the first day of the rollout following the end of a beta relationship between the county and Web Tribe Limited. Today marks the first day Nairobi residents are required to use a different code and different pay bill number to pay for services to the Nairobi County government. Motorists, traders and businesses in the capital will now remit their taxes through an internally managed system using the new USSD short code STAR 235 hash. After a spot check in various streets around the capital, it appears it is not going according to plan, with many claiming they had no idea of the transition. I don't know anything about the new one. It is, in fact, you is telling me about the new one. No, I'm not aware. I'm not aware. I've been paying using Star 217. The Nairobi County government officially parted ways with the Web Tribe Limited that runs Jumbo Pay with hints of a relationship gone sour. We expected that our partner would give us the data we asked for as soon as we asked for it. But we were actually receiving it yesterday. We did give a notice uh, well in advance to the client, even before the contract, beginning of the year. We are now in, uh, uh, we are in June. Uh, so that is six months ago. Uh, we indicated that uh, you know, our will unwillingness to continue with the engagement, uh, we, as a matter of fact, did not uh, tender. Nairobi residents and visitors are now calling for better information flow from the county government. Isema kuna system mpya na hakuna mtu wa kutuambia bila tutalipa. There was no billboard, there was no, no, no civic education on the part of the city council telling us come Monday things will have changed. Others tried to be more optimistic. Inakaa tu nikigonja. Takaa tu nikigonja nione kama watalipa na pia hiyo si nimesaviwa 200. So <laughs> Anita Nkonge, NTV. Farther afield and uh, news making headlines across the border, light traffic is returned to the streets of Khartoum on the second day of a nationwide civil disobedience campaign called to pressure the ruling military to hand over power to civilians. Monday remained quiet in Khartoum, although some businesses started to reopen and a few business buses were running. Most shops, markets and banks in the capital and in several other cities remained closed as staff followed instructions from the Sudanese Professional Association to not attend work. The campaign comes a week after deadly crackdown on protesters in Khartoum left dozens dead in almost two months since the April 11th ouster of Sudan long-term ruler Omar al-Bashir following months of protest. We took a break. We'll be back with more stories.
It is time to get down to business. Welcome, I am Julian Amboko. Kenya Airways shareholders have strongly opposed the nationalization of the airline against the background of the carrier posting a 7.5 billion shilling net loss for the year ended December 2018. As the stormy reign of the airline's chief executive Sebastian Mikos nears the end of its flight, Kenya Pipeline Company's chairman John Gumi has been elected to join the board while KQ's chairman Michael Joseph has been added another three years as the head of the board. NTV's Lillian Carey attended the company's 43rd annual general meeting and filed the following report. Report. The harrowing pain of an investment that might never come to fruition. It's yet another year of hoping against hope as shareholders endure their interaction with the board with no mention of dividends. We are very, very disappointed. From six, seven years ago, shareholders have never received a dividend. More so, uh, our shares were consolidated so that they can be able to accommodate the banks which had read them money uh, to convert their debt into equity. And so what has been happening is that uh, we have been going down, 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 and our value of shares now, they are negligible. Kenya Airways chairman Michael Joseph says that Sebastian Mikos, the Polish national who was headhunted to change the fortunes of the airline, will leave the company to attend to his children's education. His looming departure has made some shareholders uncomfortable. It's quite sad to see Mr. Sebastian leaving at the end of the year. When you see someone like that having to, to throw in the towel when the game is still on, uh, Probably what you'll see after is somebody who's favoured to take on after that, and, and that, that could only lead to, to the situation we're sending. I've been a banker to Kenya Airways. Seasoned investment banker John Ngumi, who is currently the chairman of Kenya Pipeline Company, which has been battling graft allegations, has been elected as a director to the board. The term of KQ chairman Michael Joseph, who ironically is linked to Safaricom, the most profitable company in the region, has been extended by three years. The national carrier is on a steady climb towards flying out of the red zone with the costs of fuel, personnel and maintenance of aircraft perpetually providing a drag on its bottom line. Our cash flow has always been in inhibited by the financial restructuring that we did. So that's our biggest challenge. I think we have a strong team, we have a great staff. I think just to, 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 to put in place the measures where we can start to grow the, 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 the airline, grow the network, grow the destinations, grow the fleet, these are the big challenges that we have, but they're all predicated on having enough financial structure to do this. And that's why we are looking for different ways of how we can give the, the financial stability and structure uh, to the airline. As most shareholders left downcast following the depressing results, the national airline has one promise, that it is looking at improving its passengers' numbers so that it can significantly boost the revenue levels. Lillian Kiarie, NTV. And back to the currency conversation, the Bank of Uganda has suspended the exchange of the Kenyan banknotes in the country with immediate effect and asked commercial banks to subject financial flows to and from Kenya to, to enhance due diligence. Uganda now joins the Bank of Tanzania, which also issued a similar directive on Sunday, following the rollout of Kenya's new generation currency notes as advised by the Central Bank of Kenya. The directives by the banking regulators are aimed at combating illicit financial flows in the region and are meant to compel anyone holding the old the Kenyan currency notes into, their, into the two countries to get into Kenya to transact. On to Mata's national budget, the national budget will be read later this week, and with it comes the challenge of raising sufficient revenue to finance government expenditure. The Kenya Revenue Authority has the arduous task of collecting sufficient revenue, even as the government walks the fine line in determining what to allocate towards expenditure and what to spend on debt repayment. Alex Mwangi takes a look at KRA's difficult task and what the tax experts have to say on the way forward. According to the budget estimates, the Kenya Revenue Authority has a target of 1.9 billion shillings in the coming financial year, up from 1.7 billion shillings in the current financial year. Towards achieving that target, KRA has to embrace changes at the top, with James Gedi Mboro having been appointed to take over from John Jiraine. 
Widening the country's tax base is likely to be among the foremost objectives of Gidi. We have 19 million voters and around 3 million taxpayers. So that particular difference is quite big. The 16 million who are not paying taxes need to be brought to the tax net. We think that um, we can't or government cannot continue to milk a cow you know, beyond a certain point. Uh, we pay 30% corporate tax. The reality of the matter is uh, you can walk in the streets, you will feel it. Businesses are really struggling. Go to the NSE, almost um, 30% of listed entities have given profit warnings, no dividends. And in fact, uh, you go to the middle tier businesses, people are closing down, factories are closing up. For KRA to achieve its ambitious revenue target for the next financial year, it will need to devise innovative ways to widen the tax base, as a blanket increase in taxes by the National Treasury might turn out to be counterproductive. It will also need to cling on to hope that reforms in various other sectors of the economy will take place in order to improve the tax collection base. Property developers say, and they've published this, that sometimes it takes them more than a year, right, after you've gotten the financing, to get the permission to actually start your construction. So what that means is if you borrowed money, right, at 12, 13%, you're paying 13% for that money before you even get the permission to start building. So when you put all these together, no wonder they can't build for the lower end people. They will build for middle class and other people who have higher incomes and for whom the margins are probably higher. The demands for spending for the Big Four agenda, which is a legacy project for President Uhuru Kenyatta, are likely to pile pressure on KRA to ramp up its collection. There are changes that have been proposed to the Income Tax Act that have, however, failed to convince some tax experts that the outcome will be different from the status quo. Even before you developed the draft bill, you needed to come up with a policy. We have not seen a policy. And we are saying that the bill we have has not addressed the issue of widening the tax net. The other one is harmonization with other legislation. You can basically be looking at a situation whereby the one act is saying this, the other one is talking the other. Among other things, the authority will need to keep a tight rein on governance and specifically the collusion of some of its employees with unscrupulous traders seeking to circumvent the payment of taxes, as this will mean less revenue to fund the government's projects. Alex Mwangi, NTV. And let's stay with the subject of fiscal policy. Now, the budget-making process takes place every year, but the details as to what it entails remain sketchy for many, even though it has a well-laid-down procedure. I will take you through the process step-by-step step to give you a better understanding of it and also to let you know when, as a member of the public, you can chip in to make your views known. Now, the national budget calendar always starts with the national treasury, laying out the guidelines for public participation and also the county executive members for the various counties to give respective guidelines for public participation at the county level. Now, this is required to have taken place by the 30th of August each year. And this about uh, public participation now lays the ground for the second step of um, public participation in terms of the budget preparation. And that is by the start of January each year, the Commission on Revenue Allocation is required to submit recommendations on the division of revenue between the national and county governments. In essence, the CRA divides the national cake and proposes the, how the split between the two levels of government should take place. This should have happened by the first of January each year. Now, the third step in the preparation of the budget is that by mid-February each year, the Treasury Cabinet Secretary is expected to table the Budget Policy Statement or the BPS, and that is before the Parliament. The statement sets out the broad policy objectives, which will guide the expenditure of both the national and county governments also submitted alongside this at the Debt Management Strategy and the Division of Revenue Bill. Now, that sets the stage for the step number four for the county, for the budget preparation rather, and that is by the end of February each year, the Parliament is expected to have reviewed and approved the budget policy statement, while the respective county assemblies are expected to have done the same for the county fiscal strategy papers. Now, that should take place by the 28th of February each year, and that lays the ground for the fifth step in the preparation of the budget, and that is once the budget policy statement has been approved, it is required to be made public by the start of March in the year, and this is in line with the Public Finance Management Act requirement for public participation, and that sets the stage for the next step, which is by mid-March, the Parliament is expected 
expected to have passed the Division of Revenue Bill as well as the County Allocation Revenue Bill. These are meant to guide the equitable distribution of revenue between the national and the county governments as provided by the Constitution. Now, once that is done, we move to the next step, which is the National Treasury will then be expected to submit the budget estimates before the Parliament by the end of April. The Judicial and Parliamentary Service Commissions are also expected to submit their budget estimates for the same period at that same time, and that should happen by the 30th of April. Now, the next step after that is that by the end of the second half of the financial year, which in essence is June 30th, Parliament is expected to have passed the Appropriations Bill, which authorizes the government to spend the funds. This deadline also applies to the county assemblies to approve the expenditure estimates for the next financial year, and that is by the 30th of June. Now, once that is complete, and that is normally deals with the Budget and Appropriations Bill, we move and that 90 days after the Parliament and the county assemblies have interrogated and approved their respective budget estimates, they are required to have approved the accompanying finance bills, which then give the government the tools to raise the revenue expected to enable them to finance their expenditure. And that is how the budget preparation policy statement takes place. And that is how we are going to the budget reading on Thursday. And that wraps up the business bulletin tonight. I hand you back to uh, Okari Dennis and Olive. Thank you, uh, Julians uh, and uh, Okari Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Tea, as I can attest, and I'm sure many a Kenyan can attest, is one of the most popular beverages. But do you know just how tea manufacturers ensure you get the best quality tea? No machine can assess the quality of tea better than human test buds. So yes, someone is employed to test your tea before you do. For this week's My Job segment, NTV's Martin Moura caught up with a tea taster from Gashege Tea Factory in Kiambu to get a glimpse into what it's like to taste tea for a living. Here's what she shared. My name is Nora Nyaga, the factory manager of Gashege Tea Factory. I've been a tea taster for 16 years. In tea processing, we have to ensure that strict controls are being observed. So an hourly quality assurance has to be done. That's where the tea tester comes in. We are able to assess the tea and understand the quality of the tea we are dispatching out to our customers. When the tea tester arrives at the tea tasting bench, the first thing is you smell. The aroma will give you something or will give you a background of how your liquor looks like. At the liquor, we look at the color, we look at the depth of that color, and the actual tasting bit, which I will demonstrate, will give us the strength and the briskness of the liquor. First of all, looks at the leaf. You're able to tell the color, you're able to tell the uniformity, you're able to tell the texture, you're able to tell if it has fiber or stock. The infusions, you're able to tell the color. The color will tell you if the oxidation process was well done. The texture is able to tell you if the cutting was well done. Put some liquor in the tasting goblet. And then suck the tea and atomize it at the back of your mouth. It takes practice. If you do it as a new tester today, you will actually get choked. So it takes practice. You learn as you continually uh, uh, get the on-job training and then you swirl it like take it round in your mouth so that you can have a feel the viscosity the bitterness and the heaviness of the liquor when you're doing that you are ensuring that your sensory nerves which Take the smell to the nose, also give you the smell of the liquor. And you, you, you do that for all the grits. And uh, we, we use tea glossaries. And the terms that are here are able to tell us how we can grade our tea. So if you find that your tea is clean, you give a high ranking mark. If you find your tea has got fiber, you will give a low, a low ranking mark that tells you maybe you need to rework or maybe you need to sit down the process line where there is 
a gap in your processing. We say tea is a gentleman's business, so the trust that you create with your customer is very important. And that is why there is a very stringent system on how we eventually release our tea in the, in the market. You cannot release bad tea and expect good money. So a tea tester is a person who ensures that a factory has got a consistent brand in the market. To be a tea tester, you should have studied food science, field of agriculture, horticulture, and then you come and have an in-house training. The in-house training, the tea testers are exposed to various types of tea, off-grade, off-note off, off teas, good quality teas, and standard. And within a period of about six months, you will have a fair knowledge of how the teas look like. Things like uh, eating very spicy foods can affect how your taste buds function. Yeah, if you're smoking a lot, it can also affect. Of course, it requires patience and persistence. And to be smart at your, at your work and to be exceptional means you have to put in a lot of hard work. Did you see how she tasted that tea? She was like... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm planning to annoy, and I'm, not, I'm going to start now annoying a lot of people in the office. So, so, so I'm going to start drinking my tea so with I'm, all those noises. She said something about the sensory... Okay, yeah, I don't know. I do that when I'm drinking porridge. Okay. okay, the Ethics in Anti-Corruption Commission now say that the cost of the Integrity Center, the building that houses it, has been, had been undervalued in 2013. Parliament's Public Accounts Committee has been investigating how the building that was valued at 400 million just four years ago was sold at 1.5 billion shillings in 2018. The SEC now blames the National Lands Commission that approved the acquisition of the building, NTV's Eunice Omolo reports. The seats of the anti-corruption body, the Integrity Center, has been the subject of investigations by a parliamentary watchdog committee that is looking into how EACC acquired the building for 1.5 billion shillings, yet the building was valued at 400 million Kenya shillings just three years ago. The Public Accounts Committee was today on a truth-finding mission at the EACC headquarters after the Auditor General flagged the inflated cost. The commission, however, says the building was undervalued at the time of sale. And the uh, idea you are asking may not be the concern of us as much. Because the media out there talk about 400 million as the value of this property, uh, the whole of it. Which again is very questionable. Which cannot be 400 million. Sources within Parliament indicate that some officials, past and present, at the country's investigative body might have been involved in bypassing some laws in the purchase of the building whose value is in question. Parliament now is trying to establish if indeed the building is worth the value it was bought at or are there some individuals with personal interest. ESCC placed the blame on the doors of the National Land Commission that approved payments at a special compulsory land acquisition compensation committee sitting in 2018. Yet there were no documents on the structure and architectural design of the building. You still insist when I see you that uh, you would not have any architectural or structural drawings to this property. I received drawings from NLC uh, of this building. Uh, when I looked at the drawings, I called my officer in charge of administration. We opened, and what we saw were just drawings uh, that had no signature. They had. Uh, Do you have them here? We returned them. Last week, the watchdog committee probing the acquisition of the Integrity Center had expressed doubts on whether the valuation was done on the prime property that saw the directors of Tegas Limited pocket 1.5 billion shillings and make a 1.1 billion shillings profit of the taxpayers. Eunice Omolo, NTV, Nairobi. Sports is next with Waringa Aida. Stay with us.
days to the biggest tournament in most Harambe Stars players' careers. And the same could be said for two Kenyan referees who received call-ups to officiate at the African Cup of Nations. Well, with so much attention on the national team, we took some time out to catch up with one of the Kenyan match officials in Akuru ahead of the Continental Showpiece. Road to AFCON 2019 in association with Go TV. Gilbert Chariot has been going through the intensely physical referee paces for the last 14 years, but this could be the most exciting one yet, with the buzz of the African Cup of Nations a short while away. It's an honor and privilege to officiate, because that is like uh, the World Cup of Africa. The 36-year-old assistant referee is among two Kenyan match officials selected to officiate at the 32nd edition of the AFCON, the other being center referee and university mathematics don, Dr. Peter Wawero Kamaku. Cheriot, a former geography and history teacher himself, started out as a player before eventually finding his niche on the other side of the game. He obtained his basic level 3 referee course in 2005 and has been on an upward trajectory since, officiating at Sekafa, AFCON Under-17 and Under-20, two Chan tournaments, CAF Champions League and Confederation Cup, as well as World Cup qualifiers. The big stage has also come with its fair share of challenges and high-pressure situations. Cherry Yacht points to the 2013 World Cup qualifier between Liberia and Senegal as being particularly high-octane. The fans really wanted the match because if Liberia won the match, they were going to the World Cup. So that was their last chance there. Yeah, so at around four hours before kickoff, the stadium was packed. The 56 match officials, 26 center referees and 30 assistants selected by the Confederation of African Football to officiate at the Continental Showpiece were taken through two trainings, one in South Africa that specifically dealt with video assistant referee VAR and the other in Morocco that was integrated with field of play. Despite the enormity of AFCON, the ambitious chariot is looking ahead. Maybe after AFCON, you're aiming for... The World Cup under something. The referees are set to leave the country this week ahead of the Afghan kickoff on July 21st. Road to Afghan 2019 in association with Go TV. Experience the unforgettable with the Total Africa Cup of Nations with Super Sport on Go TV. Go TV. Live it, love it. Proudly brought to you by Betin. And speaking of the 2019 African Cup of Nations, television firm MultiChoice, through its products DSTV and GoTV, has announced that it will bring all action from Egypt live and in HD. Kenya will play its opener of the Continental Showpiece on June 23rd against Algeria in Pol C. And DSTV and GoTV subscribers can gear up for the action at no extra cost. Subscribers will also have the opportunity to enjoy magazine shows, pre- and post-game analysis from leading football experts and well-packaged highlights. The games kick off on June 21st and will run until July 19th with over 50 matches set to be available. We are our own, so we want to encourage our subscribers to connect to DSTV and GoTV as well. Still on matters football and KCB Football Club has appointed former Gormahia assistant coach Zedekiah Ziko Otieno as a new head coach. Otieno replaces a former immediate coach Frank Ouna who has left the club after seven months in charge. Ziko ended his two and a half year stay at Kogalo after a historic season that saw them achieve their best ever CAF Confederation Cup finish as well as a third straight KPL title. KCB finished 10th in the league with 45 points after promoting to the top flight league. The team says that it will be targeting a top four finish in the Kenyan Premier League during the 2019-2020 season. Crossing borders now and Portugal became the first team to win the UA Nations League after Agoncalo Guedes' goal gave them a 1-0 win over Netherlands in the final. Portugal had only 45% possession but were more dangerous throughout as they added another...
tea. Tiesta has given me a hankering for tea. And uh, <laughs> I will be drinking tea as I catch Mark Masai on a press pass. He is engaging Charles Kerich, Masharia Gaido, Christine Guku, and Lydia Madhya on how journalists conduct big interviews. So that's definitely one to watch out for. Immediately after this bulletin, so you do not want to go far, just get your cup of tea and then uh, get right back in front of your television screen. My name is Barrows Olive. Mine is Okari Dennis, our sign language presenter tonight has been Flora Atieno. Good night.